Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. Hello everyone, welcome back to Talking Tudors, episode 154. I'm your host, Natalie Gruniger, and I'm so glad that you could join me. I'd like to start, as always, by thanking the wonderful listeners who continue to support this podcast via Podbean Patron, and extend a heartfelt thank you to everyone who's taken the time to rate and review the show. This really does help new people find us. If you love the podcast and you never miss an episode, perhaps you'd consider becoming a Talking Tudors patron. Just click on the Be My Patron on Podbean badge on the homepage of my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, or click on the Be a Patron button on the Podbean app. Join the Talking Tudors patron family, and in addition to receiving lots of Tudor-themed goodies, you'll be automatically entered into our patron-only monthly giveaways. April's prize is a wonderful book and stationery bundle sponsored by Shaw House, a striking Elizabethan manor house built in 1581 and located in Berkshire, England. All patrons are also eligible to attend monthly Talking Tudors live talks, which take place on Zoom. These events are exclusive to patrons. This weekend, I'll be chatting to Dr Owen Emerson about a new exhibition that's opened at Heber Castle, entitled Becoming Anne, Connections Culture Court. Please get in touch with me if you'd like to register for this event. You can also support the podcast and share your love of Tudor history with the world by buying Talking Tudors merchandise. There are a number of designs and products available, including phone cases, mugs, notebooks, and apparel. Check out all the products at talkingtudors.threadless.com. I would absolutely love to see pics of you wearing or using your Talking Tudors merch, so please do tag me on social media and use the hashtag ILoveTalkingTudors. Now, on to today's episode. I'm excited that joining me on the show to talk about the life and times of Alessandra de' Medici is Professor Catherine Fletcher. Catherine is Professor of History at Manchester Metropolitan University and the author of several books, including most recently, The Beauty and the Terror, an alternative history of the Italian Renaissance. She began her career working as a BBC researcher, but decided that history was much more fascinating than current affairs, and inspired by a holiday in Florence, went back to university to study, eventually for a PhD. She's now a regular broadcaster and writer on the history of this period, and enjoys spending time researching her books in the Italian archives. Our conversation is coming up straight after this short musical break, courtesy of guitarist John Sayles. Thank you. 
welcome to Talking Tudors. Catherine, how are you? I'm very well and thank you for having me on the show. I suppose a really good place to start is, is you just introducing yourself to our listeners and just telling us a little bit about your background. Yeah, sure. So I am Professor of History at Manchester Metropolitan University in the UK. I have been studying and working on history um, pretty much full time for almost 18 years now, which seems a long time. And but before that, I worked for the BBC in the political unit. So I have a little bit of a background in broadcasting as well. And so increasingly, I write books for general readership, not just academic books. And I do this kind of podcasting and um, some radio too. And I enjoy getting that mix of the more academic work and things that reach out a little bit further. Wonderful and we are actually here to talk about one of your wonderful books and that is The Black Prince of Florence, The Spectacular Life and Treacherous World of Alessandro de' Medici. So can you tell us a little bit about this particular book? So, so this book came out in 2016 but I first started thinking about Alessandro back in around 2010-11. I was living in Florence at the time and in between um, being on my fellowship, writing a history book, writing a different history book at that point, one about Henry VIII's first divorce, I was doing a little bit of work with an English language theatre company who were based in Florence, and they were thinking about a production of Othello. So as the historian um, in contact with them, they asked me to sort of find a little bit of background about Black Africans in Renaissance Italy. And I started reading around that topic, and that brought me to Alessandro. Now, Alessandro is a really interesting character in terms of the history of um, race in Italy. He Uh, was the Duke of Florence from 1532 to 1537. He was an illegitimate member of the Medici family and some people think that his mother was African or mixed race or a slave and we can come on to that Uh, but that was kind of what was happening at the time and at the time I also went along to uh, an exhibition in Palazzo Strozzi in Florence which was about actually was about Mannerist art but they had in this show a series of 10 little portraits of members of the Medici family and one of those portraits is of Alessandro and it's the port of all his portraits it's the one in which he looks most obviously black so I was quite fascinated by this story I didn't come to it immediately but I I you know, when I was looking for a next book topic, it was one of the things that I sort of ran past my agent and she was very keen and so was the publisher. So we decided to go for it. Can you tell us a little bit more about who Alessandro's parents were? I know there's a, a bit of that controversy that you mentioned yeah. <laughs> surrounding his parentage. Anything else like that that might help us get to know him a little bit better? Okay, so the person in the Medici family who probably has the biggest name recognition is a guy called Lorenzo de' Medici, who lived in the second half of the 15th century. And Alessandro is probably, with slight qualification here, his great-grandson. Alessandro is the son, um, so three generations down, the son of Duke Lorenzo de' Medici of Urbino. And Duke Lorenzo, so Lorenzo the Magnificent's grandson, was the last legitimate male member of that main line of the Medici family. Now, who was um, Alessandro's mother? That is um, an interesting question, and one that we can't be absolutely secure about. She is called, in some sources, Simonetta da Colavecchio. Elsewhere, she's called Anna. And There's a third reference which I find quite interesting in um, the will of Alessandro's grandmother to a woman called Senuera who receives a significant legacy but is otherwise unidentified. And that would be the sort of place where one might find the mother of an illegitimate child. But we just can't, we, we can't absolutely say. However, it seems most likely that she was a servant possibly enslaved, possibly not, we can't be sure, working in the Medici household. That's the story that we get from sources who are quite close to the situation. Now, there's a question mark also, however, about Alessandro's father, because some people say he was, in fact, the son of Giulio de' Medici, who went on to be Pope Clement VII. This is, again, one one of those things, you know, in retrospect, we just can't know. And there are slightly different versions of this story. There's a version that I think is largely discredited now by the more recent scholarship that says we can tell Clement was his father because Clement particularly favoured Alessandro. Now, as I think we'll come on to, that doesn't seem to be what happened. 
but the, the reason Alessandro becomes Duke of Florence is not because he's Clement's favourite. So that sort of argument for him being Clement's son doesn't really work. There is also the possibility, however, rather unpleasant um, prospect, but one we have to bear in mind, that a young woman working in a Medici household might have been sexually exploited by more, more than one man of the family. And there is a source a hostile source that says that she was sleeping with both of them and indeed with her own husband as well. So again, we just can't know. But I mean, unfortunately, that type of situation is all too common. So we can't be absolutely sure, but the story that was generally accepted and put about at the time was that Alessandro was Lorenzo's illegitimate son. And it was generally agreed that his mother was a woman of low rank and low status. Goodness, I can see why you were drawn to the story. There's yeah, so much obviously mystery incredible. and yeah. controversy surrounding. Yeah. <laughs> um, I imagine that our, quite a lot of our listeners have heard about the Medicis. So why were they such a, a powerful and an important family at this point? But if you go back a few generations, actually a couple of generations above Lorenzo the Magnificent, so we're talking sort of six generations back from Alessandro now, they made their fortune as bankers and as wool merchants in Florence. They were um, bankers to the Pope in the early um, 15th century. They really managed with that wealth to consolidate a party of allies within the city of Florence to enable them to become not quite the lords of Florence because Florence was a republic and the office holders were elected and rotated within a fairly limited elite male electorate, but nonetheless, these are elected positions. But the Medici gradually came to dominate government to the point where um, Pope Pius II in his memoirs I mean, talks about being sort of kings in all but name. So they're very close to being the lords of the city, but that they're not quite they maintain this facade that it's a republic they do have a little bit later on in the 15th century start getting into a bit of financial trouble so far as the bank is concerned so we have in england edward the fourth defaults on his loans um, the bank doesn't get repayments there's some mismanagement in certain branches so increasingly the medici become more and more reliant on holding those offices in Florence, having access to the state, they have their fingers in the till, they borrow money from um, <laughs> what should be um, city finances. And so they are really, really tied in, into this role in Florence, but also increasingly in Rome, where they build a parallel power structure within the Catholic Church with the election of um, Giovanni de' Medici, Lorenzo the Magnificent's son, who becomes first a cardinal and then Pope Leo X. So there are a couple of Medici popes around this time who are really important because what they give the family is a power base outside of Florence. So when things go wrong in Florence, which they do because they've got a lot of enemies, as you might imagine um, from hearing that story, they have somewhere else to go. And I'm thinking about Alessandra's early life and part of me is thinking, well, we probably don't know too much because of all the mystery <laughs> and the, the controversy. But what do we know about his early life? As you say, we do not know very much, but the point at which he turns up in the records is when his father dies and the Medici have a crisis about who will inherit because they have no more legitimate male heirs. They have two little bastards, as it says in the sources, and one infant daughter. The infant daughter is the um, a child who will become Catherine de' Medici, Queen of France. But as a woman in the elected Republic of Florence, she's not eligible to hold any offices. So she cannot be the family's figurehead in Florence, however competent and brilliant she may go on to be. That's out of the question. So they have these two little boys who, at the time of Lorenzo's death, are about maybe seven or eight years old. One of them is Alessandro. The other one, who, and that's when he first, his, his name first appears. We don't hear anything about him before then. The other one is Ippolito de' Medici, who we have heard about already because he has been acknowledged by the family already. And I think this reflects their slightly different backgrounds in terms of who their mothers were. Ippolito's mother was the gentlewoman from the town of Urbino. She's clearly kind of respectable. He is being brought into the family and, you know, given presents and grants and is, is around. Alessandro, they just don't talk about until they suddenly realise that actually having a second acknowledged illegitimate child might be useful because this is a world where dying young is a real risk. I mean, Lorenzo, Alessandro's father, has died very young, um, probably of syphilis or something associated. So that's where he turns up. But up until that point, we really don't know exactly where he was and what he was doing. 
And what about his rise to power? I know it was quite a sort of spectacular rise. Tell us about that. From this point on, his father has died. The Medici start to groom Ippolito, the elder of the illegitimate children, as the potential future figurehead in Florence. And Alessandro is very much this sort of playing second fiddle to Apollo at this point. He is around. They're talking about possible marriage alliances. Increasingly, they're talking that, that about the possibility of him going into the church and being the member of the family who maintains the position there. And this sort of trundles on for some time. We get to 1527, however, and there is a crisis for the Medici because having put Ippolito into this position of being potentially the future figurehead of Florence, all running along in the background of this period, there has been a, an extended series of wars in Italy. And in 1527, there is a crisis when the Medici and their allies get expelled from Florence and basically lose their position, leaving them with only the power in the church in Rome as their major base. At that point, Clement VII, member of the Medici family, is Pope. A little bit further down the line, 1529, he gets ill and he thinks, we haven't got power in Florence. If I die, we won't have power in Rome either. He's the last of the Medici holding office in the church. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make Ippolito, the elder of the two boys, a cardinal. So he makes Ippolito a cardinal think in a sort of crisis manoeuvre. And then, quite unexpectedly, Clement recovers. And this leaves the family in a position where they've got their two sons the wrong way around because it was expected Hippolyta should be ruler of Florence and the younger and lower ranking Alessandro should have been in the church. But now Hippolyta's in the church, they can't take him out without it. A, a dreadful sort of political scandal and upsetting lots of people. So he has to stay in the church and suddenly Alessandro is the candidate to be ruler of Florence. Some raised eyebrows about this, but they pursue this strategy and they make an alliance with the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V, to get the support of Spanish troops to basically besiege and then take back the city of Florence for the Medici and their supporters. So it's a long kind of process of international geopolitics. And into this, I should mention on the side that this is also part of the story of Henry VIII's divorce from Catherine of Aragon. With some listeners will have picked up that name, Clement VII, and Clement VII is obviously the Pope who says no to the divorce. And one of the reasons he says no to the divorce is that he wants Charles V's support to retake Florence, and Charles is Catherine of Aragon's nephew. So here at play, we have this family strategizing of Clement and Florence, which has all these, you know, weird, it's kind of the butterfly fluttering its wings and, and causing some kind of hurricane over in England, because what Clement wants above all is to get his family back into power. And if that means turning down Henry to get, to get Charles' support, then he's absolutely going to do that. That's such an interesting insight. I, I like when we can see things from a different perspective. It's quite interesting. Yeah. That? yeah. And I imagine that the older brother wasn't very happy with this arrangement. Goodness, it must have really divided the family at that point. Yes. It. Let, I mean, it, it, without doing too many spoilers, it makes people yeah. want to go to the book. This ends up with a. Uh, this is a very, very because a very, very bloody rivalry between yes. the between these cousins. Ippolito uh, really, really resents the fact that he has been demoted from the role that he expected as ruler of Florence. He variously tries to you know, raise troops to march on the city. He solicits a, a, a plot to assassinate Alessandro, and then, of course, Alessandro has to respond to that. So it's a very, very wow. tense situation between them, particularly after Uncle, Uncle Clement dies and is no longer around to sort of keep a lid on things. And what about the Florence that Alessandro is ruling at this point? What is it like in the 1530s? At this point, Florence has just come out of a pretty brutal period of war, which had culminated in a months long siege of the city in which the the men had largely been left in the city. The men who, who were opponents of the Medici, women, a lot of the women and children had left. They were besieged by, not just by Spanish troops, but with the military backing of Spain and the Holy Roman Empire for months on end, eventually cutting off supplies and through the threat of sanctions against the merchants who were supplying Florence to the point that the city was forced into surrender. So it was a very, very politically divided city. It was a very, very tense place. There were you know, reprisals against some of the enemies of the Medici. So one of the leaders of the opposing party, Raffaello Girolami, and 
died mysteriously in jail. There's a lot of, quite a lot, a lot of people went into exile and, and, and just felt that they, they couldn't stay. And this is a very, very nervous sort of atmosphere in the city. And Alessandro isn't around for that point. He has got off to do his best to impress Charles V, whose illegitimate daughter he um, is going to marry. This is a young woman called Margaret of Austria, really a child at that point. She was very, very young when they were first betrothed. So it's very, it has to be really quite a long engagement. So he's trying to impress the emperor, which he does quite successfully. He has all, he, he's very good at doing all the Renaissance prince type things like jousting and hunting. And he goes out and plays football in the square in Florence. And he's, he's very kind of, you know, he likes his athletic skills, a little bit like Henry VIII, that same type of, you know, glamorous young prince figure. And that plays very well for him at the imperial court with, with Charles. So he personally isn't involved in some of the um, sorting out of enemies of the Medici family that goes on in Florence at this point. He, he comes back in and he runs quite a populist sort of government in Florence, making sure there's public entertainments for people, um, trying to deal with food shortages, trying to make sure that the law is properly implemented and that he's obtaining justice for his subjects. So, I mean, I think to some extent, although he's by this point running um, what's perceived by the critics as quite a tyrannical regime, it's also a regime that that is quite populist in some ways and has some public appeal. Yes, and I thought there was turmoil in England at this point. It seems yeah. like it's kind of all over the place. Kind of everywhere, yeah, absolutely. Oh, goodness. All right, well, you, you mentioned that he does, in fact, get married at some point. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about his wife and, and whether they had any children as well? Yes. Yeah, so, so the wife is Margaret of Austria and she was the illegitimate daughter of the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, again with a housemaid. Um, women working in household service don't seem to have it. Uh, particularly, yeah, you can't, can't really say no to a visiting guest if he is the emperor. In any case, she so her, her daughter was, however, acknowledged, brought up in a noble family in the Low Countries and became a pawn in all this international marriage brokering that goes on as part of the diplomacy in the period. Now, she is very, very young. I mean, she's only about 14 when she eventually marries Alessandro in 1536. And they do not have children. It's possible there are some reports that she has a miscarriage. She's quite young to consummate the marriage, but given the instability of Florence and the government at the time, I think there was quite some urgency to try and have an heir as soon as possible. So I wonder if that sort of fed into the decision to consummate when she was still only, only 14. Sometimes when you have very, very young couples in these sort of arranged marriages, they decide to delay it, but obviously not in this particular case. But she didn't have children before Alessandro died in 1537. Alessandro did have two illegitimate children, um, Giulio and Giulia, with his mistress, Tadeo Malaspina, who he seems to have had quite a, you know, a, a, an ongoing relationship with. She, she and her sister ran a bit of a kind of salon in Florence with lots of, um, her sister was the mistress of Alessandro's chief minister. So that the two of them had quite, a, had a palazzo, which became quite a, a space for sort of poets and writers and so on to socialize and so so there are two children there and they are essentially adopted later on into the Medici family and and grow up and actually one of the existing minor lines of the Medici family are Julia's descendants today the Medici of Ottajano but they are not major enough to inherit in the main oh, line goodness all these different threads going at <laughs> yes. it in, in different ways <laughs> now as i think we hinted earlier this story unfortunately does not have a happy ending for alessandro so what happens to the duke of florence in january 1537 Alessandro in January 1537 was assassinated. And this isn't a spoiler because I actually begin the book with the assassination. The assassination is a very, very famous story because the assassin himself wrote up an account of why he did it. And the assassin is a guy called Lorenzino de' Medici, little Lorenzino, sometimes referred to as Lorenzaccio, which means bad, Loren bad Lorenzo. <laughs> um, so he's the, and he claims to have done it in the interest of restoring Florence to liberty and to being a republic against the tyranny of this low-born tyrant who's come in and forced himself on the city, behaved very badly, gone around seducing lots of women, generally behaved in an entirely inappropriate way, should not ha ever have been duke in any case because of the low status of his mother. And Lawrence Senior claims to be doing the republican opponents of the Medici a favour by assassinating 
his cousin Alessandro. Now, actually, as it happens, Alessandro's supporters quite quickly regroup and they find another Medici cousin, Cosimo de' Medici, to make Duke of Florence instead. So Lorenzino politically doesn't succeed, but he rhetorically, by publishing this account of why he did the murder, establishes himself in this position of the new Brutus, the hero of the Republic against the tyrannical Caesar. And it's, a, I mean, it's a fascinating piece of writing. And he, he then has to go on the run and eventually gets assassinated himself by a couple of people hired by the, by the Holy Roman Emperor who objected to someone going around and assassinating his son-in-law which isn't really what you do. But it, it's fascinating, the, um, the, the, the ins and outs of, of this sort of political murder. It's very dramatically done and told as well in, in the sources. Alessandro is allegedly persuaded to, you know, meet a woman who has promised him sexual favours. And so he goes into the bedroom and he takes off the, the jacket lined with mail, kind of the, the equivalent of a Renaissance stab vest that you would wear to protect yourself against knife wounds. And so that, that way he lays himself open to attack by these, um, these assassins. So it's a very dramatic ending to his story. It is very dramatic. I was thinking, you know, the saying, I'm glad I'm not a Kennedy, but it's kind of like, I'm glad I wasn't a Medici <laughs> at this point. Uh, yeah. Yes, there are, there are not many people in this story who, who end up, who end up <laughs> alive knows. at the end of it. Yes. That's yeah. terrible. Okay. And I recently watched an interview that you gave mm. and, and you said that Alessandra was assassinated twice. Mm. I think I, I know why now, but do you want mm. to just explain yeah. what you what you meant by that? Yeah, well, I think he was assassinated twice, first with the sword and then with the pen, because he obviously is literally assassinated, but then he is the subject of an extended character assassination. I mean, initially from Lorenzino, who says, well, you know, I, I had to kill this guy because he was a tyrant, but also from many subsequent historians who like to put the blame on him as an individual of bad character or what the Medici collectively did in establish themselves as dukes of the city of Florence as opposed to the leading family within a republic. So a lot of what, what they do in the 1530s is really directed by Pope Clement VII. I mean, it's not that Alessandro is the individual bad guy in all of this. And it's not that he's significantly worse in his use of assassination or anything else that, than, than any other Renaissance ruler of the period. I mean, there are plenty of people around who do pretty unpleasant things to their enemies. That's part of the broad system of government. Assassinations are fairly widely used uh, against political opponents. So it's, it's not all that unusual. I mean, the the Tudor listeners will be familiar with Henry using judicial murder yes, quite yeah. extensively, right? So in Italy, they tend not to bother with the judicial bit and they just get on and directly commission assassinations. Um, they, don't, they don't do the facade, but, you know, everybody does it. So Alessandro, I think, is not, you know, but Alessandro is landed with a whole critique. And later on, when, particularly when you get into some of the 19th century histories, you see that merge with a story about his race. Like, he looks like a tyrant. He looks like the bad guy. You can see his bad character written in the colour of his skin and in his physiognomy. And so that comes in later on, this sort of merging of the stories about Alessandro's tyranny and about his race. At the time in the 16th century, they don't do that particularly in quite the same way. They do sort of make allusions about him being unsuitable to rule on account of his mother's low status, but it's not quite so explicitly racialized as it will be later on. And, and that actually leads really nicely into the last question that I wanted to ask you, and that was, what does Alessandro's life tell us about the prevailing ideas at the time, yeah. about race and about ethnicity? Yeah, so this is a really tough one, because a lot of the sources that talk about Alessandro as being, well, various, really talk more about his mother than about him being variously Moorish or half Negro come in a little bit later on. They come in posthumously into the sort of 1560s. So it's quite hard to say exactly how much of that was directed at Alessandro in his own time. We do know that we get critical references to his mother as being a slave in the contemporary sources that that, that was circulating at the time. And we get many references to her low status, the references. That, so less, less said about skin colour, a lot more said about the fact that she is low ranking. 
she's in the basest condition, um, you know, that she's a housemaid, sometimes that she was enslaved, although not always that, that can be quite ambiguous in the sources because the word and um, the Latin word server or ancilla can, doesn't specify a free state or an enslaved state necessarily. So I think Alessandro seems to me to be somebody who, you know, this is all getting a little bit into the realm of speculation, but if I had to speculate, I would say that he is somebody whose looks are sufficiently ambiguous that people who want to decide that they don't think he has this Moorish descent can say, you know, that's that's fine. That that's just a vicious rumor put about his put about by his enemies. It's not true. And people who do want to tell this story can equally say, well, you know, look, he's got quite brown skin. He's got black curly hair. It's more likely to be true. And uh, my feeling is that the simplest explanation for the stories about Alessandro's race is that there is some truth to them or that it is was widely believed at the time that there was some truth to them. And there are certainly, I mean, it, it would be no surprise at all to find an enslaved African woman or a free woman of African descent working in a wealthy household at this time. In Italy, there are certainly plenty of people around who fit that category. So it's, it, it's entirely possible. But again, where we really get the, the, the stories about Alessandro's race really, really pick up, not in his own time, but in the 19th century, in that context of the so-called scientific racism, where historians get really interested in what somebody's perceived bit race might tell us about their character. What a fascinating story. It's been really mm. wonderful to hear more about him. And I, I recommend that anyone that's listening that's interested, you know, go and have a look at your book for the details about this person's life. Really quite an amazing mm. story. Are you working on anything else at the moment, Catherine? Are you writing anything? I am writing a book about people traveling to Rome across two millennia, which wow. is really, really good fun. And yes, many, many stories of people who embarked on the roads to Rome one way or the other, whether as pilgrims, sometimes as crusaders leaving Rome, sometimes as grand tourists, all sorts of travelers, business people and, and so forth. So I well, enjoy getting it. That does sound great. Yes. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. Now, the last thing that we do here on the podcast is what I call 10 to go. So these are just 10 <laughs> questions just to get to know you a little bit better. Nothing, nothing too tricky. Okay. <laughs> so what was the last book that you read or maybe that you purchased? Oh, I have just been reading one of um, Sarah Paretsky's V.I. Warshawski novels, which are detective novels set mainly in Chicago which I um, really really I find really really fun I like to sort of read read something to get away from history in my in my time out yes definitely I know what you mean you have to remove yourself sometimes yeah. <laughs> and what's something that you really like or you love about where you live oh, I live just by a canal a sort of a historic um late 18th, early 19th century canal. And it's really lovely to look out at the water and to see boats coming past. And yeah, that's that's one of my favourite things about the part of Manchester I live in. Now that we're kind of out and about travelling a little bit more, mm -hmm. do you have any holiday destinations in mind? Oh, all being well with the COVID situation, I am off to Spain this week to actually do some of that Roman roads travelling on a route that goes from Cadiz in the south of Spain up through Seville, Barcelona and around the south um, coast of France. And I'm going to probably stop at Turin because I don't think I have time to do the whole route to Rome this Easter. But yeah, really, really looking forward to getting into some of the travel for that, that new project. Oh, that does sound fun. I love Spain. That's so beautiful. We yeah. toured it in a in a camper van some years back. Oh, wow. And it was a lot of fun. <laughs> a lot of fun, I have to say. Oh, fabulous. And what's something you do to relax or unwind? Oh, I love singing. I sing with a, a choir in Manchester and I really enjoy just, you know, going out and focusing on the music and you know, you have to really concentrate and it just is really, really good for kind of clearing your mind and not thinking about anything else. Yeah, that sounds like fun. I, I love singing. I'm not a great singer, but I love singing. It's <laughs> yeah. a lot of fun. And I was going to ask you about hobbies. So apart from singing, do you have other any other hobbies? Oh, I mean, it's really hard to fit lots and lots of stuff in, but I do like just going out for walks in the countryside, getting a kind of break away from, um, you know, being indoors, reading and stuck in an office all the time. So yeah, I'm kind of very lucky that where I live is just near to the Peak District um, in England. So there are lots of gorgeous hills um, that are kind of protected from development just outside between Manchester and Sheffield. So it's great to get out there. 
um, particularly now the weather's, I hope the weather is getting a little bit better in our summer. <laughs> yeah, fabulous. And if you did have more time, is there any new skill that you might like to learn? You know, I would love to be really, really good at DIY. And I would, you know, I would like to be that person who could just sort of turn up with a drill and put up a, a set of perfectly like level shelves. And whenever I do it, I can, it like, takes me about three goes to make anything function. And I just, yeah, I just, I just slightly wish that I was one of these people who could just, you know, perfectly turn out sort of domestic furniture and <laughs> things. And I just, I'm not. And what about an ideal Saturday night? What does that consist of for you? I really like the theatre. Actually, when I, I moved to Manchester at the beginning of 2020, just in time to go into lockdown, and I had all, I, I had really, really been looking forward to living in a big city with a lot of cultural life. And of course, then immediately everything shut. So that is now that things are just, you know, getting a little bit more back to normal, I'm really looking forward to being able to see more live performance. Do you happen to have any pets where you're living now? No, I, I do a lot of traveling and it wouldn't really be fair to have a dog or a cat and keep it in the house and constantly have to so you know, give it to somebody else to look after or put it in kettles or such like so I decide so I don't my my dad and his partner have many dogs which are really really good fun um, but they live in out out in the country and it's much much more practical if you're out in the country and at home a lot of the time oh, well you so you can dog sit if you need to when you, you yeah. need your <laughs> exactly <laughs> Lucky last, Catherine, what about a show or a film or a series that you've recently watched? I'd say one of my favourite shows of recent years is Money Heist, particularly the first season. I just love it. It's just, in one sense, it is quite preposterous and over the top and silly, but I was just absolutely gripped all the way through. So I, yeah, I have a real thing. I, I like um, a lot of sort of international TV shows and that just seemed to be one that it works so well. They bring all the threads together so well. I just love the kind of set of characters. Wonderful. And the very last thing I promise you is the what I call a Tudor takeaway. But in this case, mm -hmm. it doesn't need to be specifically Tudor. Um, so something for our listeners to go off and explore after the show, maybe just to deepen their understanding of what we've been discussing or anything that you think might be interesting for them. Oh, well, I was really told with this. I do want to mention that. So since I wrote The Black Prince of Florence, there have been multiple people have gone off and written novels or drama that draw on it. So there was a novel um, by D.V. Bishop called City of Vengeance. There is a new one coming from David Hewson, both of which dramatise the story in different ways. There's a short film called Il Moro by um, Daphne Di Cinto, who some of your listeners may know from Bridgerton, uh, who oh. plays the mother of the Duke of Hastings. And she has made a short film about Alessandro, which is amazing. Um, but so it's doing the kind of art house circuit, but that is one to look out for. Um, so yeah, if you want more Alessandro stuff, those are a few places to start. <laughs> and I love, there is a great online, if you want to see a Renaissance palace in 3D, there is a 3D virtual tour of the Palazzo Te, T-E, in Mantua, which is this spectacular painted summer palace with frescoes all up the walls and around the rooms. And that is one of the locations that you would have met people like these in the 1530s. Oh, that sounds right up my alley. I need to go and check that out immediately. And mm -hmm. I will add a link to those for our listeners in our show notes. So you've given us so much to think about and, and to go and explore after the episode. Catherine, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the podcast and speaking with us. Oh, thank you, Natalie. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for joining us. I absolutely love to hear from listeners, so if you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, where you'll also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind-the-scenes news. You'll also find me on Twitter. My handle is on the Tudor Trail and on Instagram as the most happy 78. It's time now for us to re-enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon. Music